All right, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're located. Um, and welcome to our second uh, webinar of um, spring 2017 on marketing OER degrees to students. And this is Una Daly, the director of the Community College Consortium for OER, and we're just thrilled to have you join us here today. And we have several great speakers um, who are going to share their work at their colleges. We have Lyda Kaiser uh, from Lord Fairfax Community College, um, Mark Haskins from Pierce College District uh, at the JVLM, and we also have uh, Preston Davis from Northern Virginia Community College and um, James Clapp of Grosclag, who are longtime members of our community who are going to share the work that they've been doing. So uh, let's get started. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, CCCOER, as we always do. Um, please use the chat window um, during um, during the webinar, we will have some time for open Q and A um, at the end, and um, so. But during the other time, use the chat window, which is in um, it's on the left hand side of your screen there, and you should be able to see your name in the long list of participants there. Um, we have a couple of special events we want to mention as well that are coming up um, in the next month. So first, I'm going to uh, just give uh, a moment here to Lyda and Mark uh, just to, to give you a little um, flavor of what they do in their day job. Um, Lyda is the director of the Office of Transition Programs, and she's also the Title X coordinator at Lord Fairfax Community College. And Lyda, would you like to say hello to folks and maybe uh, mention some of the work that you've been doing on Knowledge to Work or uh, some of the other opportunities that you have? Sure. Um, I am an administrator in two areas of the Office of Transition Programs. I'm the assistant to the director for the uh, Knowledge to Work, which is our competency-based program that uses OERs. I also help coordinate our portion of the consortium grant from Achieving the Dream for OER degree grants in Virginia. There are six colleges. We're just one of them that does that. So I do a lot of work directly with faculty to help them to look at competencies and to help them look at open education resources and help to encourage them to use those. And I also teach, and when I teach, I always use OERs. Wonderful, Lida. So Lida wears a lot of hats, and we're really thrilled to have her here this morning. And secondly, I'd like to introduce Mark Haskins, who is the Executive Director at Pierce College at um, JBLM. So Mark, tell us a little bit about um, yourself and um, the unique um, institution that you work at. Okay, great. Uh, good morning and afternoon. Uh, I'm Mark uh, from Pierce College at Joint Base Lewis-McChord. Um, I just joined Pierce College about two and a half years ago, and when I showed up, uh, we, uh, Pierce College at Joint Base Lewis McCord is a, an extension site of Pierce College District, and um, it represents about 10 percent of the uh, uh, college population. And um, we're, we're a contract program, so we're not uh, part of the uh, state uh, FTE, and that gives us a little bit of flexibility uh, because we have our own set of instructors uh, and our own uh, administration. And um, when I first showed up, uh, my boss, uh, the president of Pierce College Fort Stillicum, Denise Yoakum, said, I want to launch a completely uh, uh, open educational resource degree uh, at Pierce College at Joint Base Lewis McCord because I know you guys can do it. She gave us a target date of launching by uh, having the complete degree online by uh, fall of 2016, uh, but we were at actually able to beat that by quite a large margin and we launched the complete OER degree um, in the fall of 2015 both online and face to face. Wonderful, Mark. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and we're going to get a very unique perspective I think from Mark because of um, the fact that they are a separately run college at the joint base. Lewis McCord Air Force Base. So thank you for that. 
Sure. Um, so I want to give our little uh, commercial on what the Community College Consortium for OER is. Um, we were founded um, 10 years ago this year. Um, and we, uh, our mission really remains the same. Um, we work with community colleges around the country and actually uh, um, in North America to expand aware, awareness and access to high quality open educational resources. Our webinars are part of the work that we do uh, with faculty and other staff and administrators at colleges to help them uh, find resources and hear about promising open educational practices. And at the heart of our work is improving student success and completion. And um, I want to mention that uh, we are in 21 states and provinces. Last month, we welcomed um, Bucks County Community College in Pennsylvania, uh, Lansing Community College in Michigan, and Coastline College in California. And in February, we are welcoming um, Another community college in California, Ventura County Community College District, um, Ivy Tech in Indiana, Lakeland Community College in Ohio, and Pierce College in Washington State. So welcome to all our new members. If you are curious and would like to see the rest of our members, please go to our website. And you can uh, click under About Us and see all of those folks. Uh, we make these webinars available to everyone, but we do appreciate our, our members who help sustain our work. Uh, now I want to mention Open Education Week. Um, it's coming up the end of March. It's an opportunity for you to create awareness on your campus around open education. And I know a lot of California colleges are in the process of doing this right now. I know a lot of colleges in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, um, Washington State, so Oregon, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, the rest of you on here uh, chime in, Maryland, are, are trying to create awareness. This is an opportunity for you um, to uh, provide um, either workshops on campus on your own or organize them around an event that's happening online. We have promotional material that you can download from the Open Education Week website. Um, CCCOER, we will um, advertise any kind of webinars or local events that you want to share um, with our members. And we have two webinars ourselves on March 28th and 29th. So uh, please go to the Open Education Week site and find out a way to uh, use that at your college to promote um, open education. So now I uh, want to get to the heart of um, our webinar today, and that is marketing OER programs um, to, to students, and in particular, uh, degree and certificate programs. So the big question is, if you build it, will they come? And for many of these programs, we're really targeting the neediest students, the students that are working full time and trying to attend school at the same time and complete their degrees. They're often not on campus a lot. They may be taking some online classes. Um, they may not be getting into uh, you know, all of the locations where your more traditional students are, are hanging out um, in, in different locations on campus. And so you have to be more um, discerning about how you reach out to those folks. And uh, so that we can get those students um, involved in these programs and enrolled so that they can have the benefit um, of the reduced cost and also the um, enhanced uh, quality of um, education. And so I'm going to turn this over to our first speaker to tell you about what they're doing at Lord Fairfax Community College to reach out to those students. Uh, Lyda? Okay, thank you very much, Nina. Um, as I introduced myself, I am the uh, director at the Office of Transition Programs, but I spent several years as the marketing coordinator for the college. So this is something that I have experience with in other areas, not just in OER. And what we've been doing, I realize, is um, a little bit different maybe from what some other people are doing in their colleges, but I still think that you can maybe get some good information out of it. Here's just a little map of, of Virginia so that all of you geographically inclined people can get a vision of where I'm sitting at the moment. It's where that number nine is. 
we're a mid-sized public institution. We're part of a huge system of community colleges in Virginia. There's 23 community colleges here. Um, we have seven counties and one independent city. We're considered in the IPEDS database mostly uh, rural and suburban. And then we have about 9,500 9, unduplicated credit students with more than 12,000 students in our various non-credit programs. We do have two campuses and uh, two centers. One of our centers is located in very lovely and very, very rural Page County, Virginia. There is not public transportation throughout our, our service region. There is some transportation in the city of Winchester and small parts of Frederick County, Virginia, but th that's about it. Um, a big disclaimer. So I don't have the magic formula for how you're going to get students to jump all over your OER classes and programs. Everybody makes their own call. Everybody knows their own population. I mean, that's what it means to be a community college, right? You know your community. Um, and we do have some unique components to our OER efforts, as I've said before. First of all, let's start out that in Virginia, the chancellor of the Virginia Community College System raised concerns about three years ago, saying textbooks cost too much money. And I want you guys to do something about this. And so the chancellor made, for every single community college president in Virginia, he made a goal that involves an increase in the courses that use OERs and reduced cost resources. And to the chancellor, that means $40 or less. So all of our presidents are evaluated on whether they're promoting this. That probably gives us a little bit of an edge uh, when we have a president who's getting evaluated on the number of courses and degree programs that use OERs. We started out with OERs as an individual initiative with instructors who either didn't like the choices available to them or were themselves concerned about the cost of, of textbooks for their community college students. In 2014, we received a DOL tax grant to start our Knowledge to Work program. That's a competency-based education program that uses OER resources and is involves six of our degree and certificate programs, very much workplace-related programs. We have a website called higher-ed.org that's a repository for free or reduced cost learning resources that are tied to competencies in many areas. It focuses a lot on those six areas of um, administrative services technology, and information technology and uh, health information management. But it also includes many, many other areas. I go to it to find things for US history. You all know, know Carrie, who has participated with you all for several years now. And that's part of her job, is she helps to locate, get access, curate all of the information that's up there. In July 2015, the VCCS announced that they had 16 institutions to be part of the Z23 project, which is a Hewlett Foundation program to create what they called Z degrees, the entire degree program using OERs. And you're going to hear from Preston about that in a little bit. And I've included on this slide the, uh, the link that if you want to go and take a look at all of that information. We were not one of those institutions. But I will tell you that the work from that Hewlett Foundation program has benefited everybody. We have all sorts of resources that are available to us. And it has really helped to propel the use of OERs. And then in 2016, we became part of six institutions to get an Achieving the Dream OER Degree Initiative grant. That includes Central Virginia Community College, Germanic Community College, Mountain Empire, Nova, you'll hear from Preston again, and Tidewater Community College. So why does all that matter? Um, well, like every other institution, we are marketing OER in a combination with a bunch of efforts and on several different levels. It's not the sole focus of our college's marketing efforts. And we only have so much money available for marketing. It hasn't really increased much in the last six years. And what we've learned is that OER marketing involves education about OER, plus marketing your courses and your programs. So, to us, this involves four groups, faculty and staff, current students, potential students, 
And then like every community college, those community people and the stakeholders that we have. Faculty and staff is very important because they have to be able to explain OER to students and answer questions that students might have. They have to know what it is, how to identify the courses that use it, and what that means for these students. Uh, we need to encourage faculty to join the effort. And this type of marketing we found is best done through internal college channels. So talking about it in meetings, emails from the president and dean, recognition for people who are doing OER work, whatever that might look like. It could be a variety of things. We focused on the opportunity we've had through grant programs for stipends, for travel to conferences, because a lot of our faculty have almost no opportunity for travel, uh, professional development, and that is something that is available to us through other VCCS schools as well, and then that ability to benefit students so that you have students that are better prepared because they can don't have to worry about whether or not they can afford the textbook. And the other piece of staff that's not up here is obvious, and that's librarians and individuals whose job it is to help faculty identify these resources. It's very beneficial to us to have Curie on our staff to help faculty find things. Uh, a lot of our faculty who started in this work just did it on their own. But between having our own uh, digital librarian as well as the BCCS information available, that really has helped our faculty and staff. Um, I will say the elephant in the room here, and this is not to be negative about faculty, but it can promoting these things can cause problems with some faculty. Many are resistant to change. Many see it as a challenge to their academic freedom. Who are you to tell me I can't use the book I want? Um, sometimes they see it as a threat if they have their own publishing efforts so they work with textbook companies. And some are worried their classes will lose enrollment if all the students run and sign up for the OER classes. I just bring that up because you have to be aware of it if you can plan for responses to those issues. As you start marketing, I think you're in a better place with it. For current students, first of all, they've got to know there's this option available to them. Now, we have an indicator in our student information system that tells them that. Um, and you have to sometimes teach students to look for it. They also need to understand that a lot of the OERs that are used can also be made available in a print format. And that interest of universal design, sometimes there are people who need that paper. And uh, we want to make sure that they know that that's a possibility, too, so they don't avoid the OER because there's somebody who needs that written piece of paper in a book. And then showing them the savings, having a cost calculator or something that shows them how much they won't be spending is helpful. Also for current students, you probably have a bunch of available resources. In our campus, we have plasma screens that rotate information. We can send texts and emails. We have electronic signs and putting them on your websites. All those are places to put that information. Yes, we know not everybody looks at them. But that's why you need to go across several platforms. I think around registration time, if you include information on OER courses in your, your Twitter posts, your Facebook posts, press releases are good. A lot of us, I think, will be doing that at the end of this month for Open Education Week. Uh, we're certainly planning to do that here. And basically, repeat the same information. For us, it's look for that SIS designation. Uh, and then, that's also something that we have to explain for those traditional classes as well as our CBE. We just constantly tell students, hey, guess what? You're not going to have to buy a $300 textbook for this class. For potential students, um, OER is kind of similar to how all community colleges market themselves, which is, you know, we're the affordable way for you to get post-secondary education. Once again, including cost calculators on the website can help to have uh, orientation and advising information if your students are required to go through that that basically shows them how to identify these classes. But for potential students, you're looking at outward facing platforms. Advertising and press coverage are important. Uh, if you have a part of your website that's targeted to parents or emailed or mailed information that's targeted to parents, include this. They're really going to care about it. Um, I have a question on my next one. We have not done this, but 
it, if any of you all have specific programs that are all OER, if you have acceptance letters, it might be a good place to put this information. And that's something that I'm kind of trying to figure out how we can include that here at Lord Fairfax. And then having information sessions that are specific to pathways that include a lot of OERs or our total OER degree programs are important. And this is something that uh, Linda Williams at Tidewater Community Colleges has, has managed very well and really increased uh, the enrollment in OER classes by doing those sessions. Then finally, those community and stakeholders. Um, employers really love this OER stuff. So let's say you have an employer you work with, and maybe they even have a contract rate for their employees to attend your college or something. But this is the kind of thing you share with them. And they'll be very excited that their employee can take a class or even get some sort of a certificate or a degree and have a minimal cost for textbooks. Once again, you're using outward facing platforms press, advertising, whatever your traditional ways are. Digital media is good. But really, I really believe old-fashioned word of mouth is just the best way to do this. You talk and tell everybody as much as you can. This is that old you know, talk to the civic groups, things like that, to provide that information so people know about it. Because if people know about it, they'll ask about it and look for it. And that's the key to getting them enrolled in these classes. What really works? Well, you know. See, I wish I knew that, um, but I don't. It, there, it just isn't a single answer. But like everything else with marketing, the key to this is educating everybody who's going to work with students, and then educating the students themselves. Uh, once again, Tidewater Community College has some great examples of what they've done, and we'll hear from the other folks that are on about some specific experiences they've had. But they, the success has been through that information being out there, then what happened at Tidewater, those OERs courses started filling first. And uh, people took note of that. So when you're talking about marketing, what's your goal? Is your goal more students? Is your goal to get more of your courses listed and, and operating under an OER format? Uh, what are your desired outcomes? And that's what you want to market for. And it can look very different when you're marketing to try to get more faculty to participate and when you're just trying to market to get more students in the door signing up for these classes. So this presentation was intended to just kind of be a starting point for what everybody is going to discuss today. And I you know, am happy to answer questions as we move forward. Waiting, I'm happy to wait till everybody else has done theirs and after we hear from everyone else's success and what's worked well for them. I thank you for your attention, and I left you with a picture of a hedgehog because uh, you know it's Wednesday, and so we all need something to make us smile. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lydie. You really covered uh, an enormous amount of ground about um, how to do the outreach, um, and we did have a few questions um, in the chat window, and I'll, I'll just repeat those to you if, if that's okay. Um, sure. And this one is from James in California. He asked, you mentioned teaching students to look for the OER indicator in the schedule. What are some ways that you do that? Uh, our, our, there are two ways. First of all, our course catalog, you can go in and you look at a class, and it has a little thing about the textbook for that class. You click on it, and it will either take you to the bookstore telling you what the book is and how much it is, or it takes you to a page that says, um, this class uses this class uses a digital resource, or this class uses a um, a resource that is both digital or and in print. Or it tells you that. Now that means that the faculty has to make it clear, and the people in the administrative assistant in my dean's office have to make sure that that link is right. And I always go in and check it. And make sure it's right. So there's that way. The second way is, um, and I think there's a slide that I saw that's going to be coming up that somebody had that actually shows what the little SIS notations are, and it just says that this is a um, this uses a free or reduced cost uh, course. And Tidewater they have it. It's it, the, the course number actually has a Z attached to it. Um, that's their thing. We, we don't have that at Lord Fairfax, but. So people have done this several different ways, but quite frankly, 
I think that um, I really like having that link that's attached in the in the course listings um, that where you click on the text because even if not all your classes are OER, you'll have a better idea how much you're going to spend that particular semester. Uh, thank you, Lida. Um, there, um, Regina from Michigan asked um, if you if you can share the wording for OER that you use in your SIS, and if that's something easy, you could put a link in for us. Um, um, otherwise, we have some examples coming up later as well. Um, and um, and and Regina had one other question, um, or she had a couple of other questions. I'm gonna. Um, I'm going to let you answer the first question if that works for you. And she also asked about how many courses are using OER at LSBC. I was just trying to figure that out because, in truth, I, I learned just this semester about four more that we didn't even know about. We had an English professor who made all of his, and this is a guy who's won the Chancellor's Award for Teaching Excellence and the the. A state Council on Higher Education in Virginia Award for Teaching Excellence. And he just did this on his own. And he's been teaching a long time. So I just found out he's got four classes. So I would say that right now we have about, uh, I want to say it's 28 classes that are, and we have um, our six degree programs and certifications for which all classes are available OER. But there are um, they're just now making sure that all of them are in there, and we're working on two more for the part of our new grant. So it's kind of like it, it, there's constantly more. Every semester we're getting about eight more classes. But the 28 are what were offered spring semester. So. And, and as you mentioned, Lida, you also have the six degree programs, which through the Knowledge to Work, which are all OER as well. Right. Yeah. So you know, I know there's some additional questions that have turned up in the chat window, but I, I kind of want to move on right now since we have a, a couple of other speakers, and we will come back to those questions at the end. And uh, also, um, Lida or any anyone else who's who's on our, our webinar today, feel free to uh, address um, some of the questions. Um, Regarding how you deal with that at your college. So thanks so much to Lida for that overview um, of all the work they do. And now I want to um, turn it over to um, Pierce College to Mark Haskins, who's the executive director there, um, to tell us about the Pierce Open Pathway uh, project and how they've done outreach to students um, to fill those programs and make sure that they're really um, a reaching out to the students that can benefit most. Mark? Thank you, Anna. Um, yes, uh, first let me say that uh, um, from, a, from a marketing strategy point of view, um, we, we experienced a lot of the same uh, issues that uh, Lida raised. And, and I think uh, you know, most of what we experienced agrees 100% with what she's saying. Uh, because of the uniqueness of our program where our faculty are actually paid uh, per student, we were able to leverage the uh, concern about losing students to OER classes to our advantage. And, and it was a, a, very, a great motivator for those faculty who weren't on board yet um, to, uh, to go OER because they didn't want to uh, lose uh, uh, students and, and therefore uh, reduce their paychecks. Uh, so that's something that you can use to your advantage uh, potentially. Uh, but it, it speaks to the point of the internal educa uh, education uh, issue first. And, and I'm a classic example. So I, I don't have a marketing background, but I, I would say my advantage towards uh, being part of this uh, was the, the fact that I didn't come from a higher education background. I'm a, I'm a veteran. And so um, I knew that there was going to be a barrier to starting to talk about open educational resources or OER with our target population, which was primarily service members and their families, that that wouldn't mean anything to them. And I wanted to avoid uh, edu-speak um, because uh, it wasn't going to resonate with our population where OER is an acronym for something completely different in the military. So my, uh, my couple slides are more example-based. 
Uh, again, from a strategic planning perspective, uh, I, I think Lida raised all the major points. Um, but uh, here, here's the kind of the journey that we went on. Uh, you know, I, I, I instantly was educated that OER is good. Uh, and we had three uh, primary reasons for that. Of course, savings is the one uh, that uh, gets the attention of our students primarily. Uh, but it's also the better learning, the flexible pedagogy, and it's more relevant uh, to our uh, information-driven age. But a third point for us that we were able to uh, market uh, to our students was that these classes, especially the online versions of these OER classes, were going to be guaranteed to be on the schedule. Uh, they were not going to be canceled, and so students could uh, could depend on that, could have the stability to plan their pathways, especially um, when this population is often deployed to the field and has to take a quarter off and that type of thing. Uh, but the bottom line is the marketing is not easy. What we decided to do at Pierce is rather than um, especially when it came to print ads and that type of thing, try and explain OER, uh, we took a different approach and that was to come up with something catchy, something that would uh, pique their curiosity, uh, and that's where POP came from, the Pierce Open Pathways. Uh, we, we were going to use POP and uh, hopefully uh, people would be interested in what this, uh, what this stood for, what this was all about. Uh, and so some of the ideas that we discussed uh, at the program um, outside of the marketing channels uh, were uh, promotions like Got Pop, uh, What the Pop. Uh, we wanted something uh, flashy and, and now and with it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is, I'm, I'm going to explain as many of the pitfalls probably more than uh, great ideas for you all, but uh, perhaps you can avoid some of the, some of the stumbles that we had. Uh, we didn't come to a consensus, um, and so uh, when it went to our uh, marketing and communication section, um, no fault of their own, but it's, it's a very uh, brand conscious and very brand strict uh, institution. Uh, so the next slide shows uh, what they came up with, which is here's open pathways. <laughs> so not uh, necessarily particularly uh, novel with regard to the uh, uh, to a catchy uh, slogan, but it, it was through the word of mouth and through the education of staff that Lida already pointed out, that to us was the key. Our, our registration personnel and our advisors, uh, we through our own internal staff meetings and information sessions, and we created a frequently asked questions type of thing. So our team fully understood POP, and then they could talk about it to the students they were registering and advising. Um, and the, the issue of identifying on the schedule was already brought up. Unfortunately, the, uh, with the uh, format, the slide got a little bit distorted, but that red arrow should be over the column that says POP. And we trained our students to look for POP. If they wanted those open classes, they would look for POP in the schedule. Um, and, and they could easily find those courses. And you know, anecdotally, um, students gravitated toward that. They, we, we have many stories where uh, they had an unexpected uh, fee that we had to pass on to them for the online, for the Canvas uh, learning management system. But then when we told them that they didn't have to pay for a textbook, uh, it, it was a, a large uh, source of relief for them. Um, now just be advised, uh, when we go to our new schedule, the bookstore uh, controls some of that and, and the new symbol for a OER course is um, is an exclamation point, like a warning. And I, I would like to negotiate with them to change that to something like a happy face. Uh, but of course, the bookstore, uh, for them, that's, that's probably not the, the, the best thing for, that, for their bottom line, that it's an open educational resource course. Uh, in any case, uh, we started with Pierce Open Pathways, and we proceeded from there. Now, uh, to our benefit, um, it, the, uh, the open educational movement really kind of took off uh, on, the, uh, on the other campuses as a whole. And so in some ways, perhaps we weren't giving our students enough uh, credit. Uh, they were understanding OERs better than, than we thought they were to the point where they were lobbying uh, our state legislature to have uh, actual um, laws uh, with regard to uh, Open ed use of open educational resources within the community and technical colleges of, of Washington State. Next slide. 
So here are just some of the examples that we did uh, in print uh, and electronic ads. Um, we started with uh, including Pierce Open Pathways or POP uh, in the ads. So you see in the upper left hand corner, uh, that's a stock photo. Um, Pierce generally prefers to use our own uh, student images and so that's what we, once we launched this, uh, got it on the streets with the stock photo, then we started to go um, more uh, with our own students. Uh, so there, there's one of our uh, students down directly below. Uh, this was from our, uh, we would print this on our, our uh, quarterly uh, information uh, brochure that has our course schedule and that type of thing, uh, our term schedule. And so uh, on the back cover it's, or uh, say goodbye to expensive textbooks. Um, they, they, obviously the, the key is the savings, but it's just really not that, not so easy to communicate that succinctly, especially for print ads. So we, uh, we, we went away from POP uh, and to, uh, to the headline type of approach of your degree, no books. Uh, and so you see a couple of different versions of that uh, featuring some of our students. And that POP uh, or the uh, OER, the textbook free uh, associate of arts degree uh, became one of our three main talking points to advertise Pierce College at Joint Base Lewis McCord, the other being others being the most classes on the base and uh, and of course the, the military friendly aspect of our program. Next slide please. So now we're at the point of contemplating what we're going to do uh, next in terms of marketing. Um, we're working on our tabletop banners and that types of thing, uh, type of thing for our outreach uh, events. And again, um, it's not so easy to come up with uh, a succinct um, headline to, to grab their attention. So you can kind of see on the uh, on the right hand side the evolution of some of the bullets that we've been considering. Uh, you know, that's the, the the top one is the first iteration, and I didn't like that at all because to me. Uh, the, 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 it buries the lead. Uh, the savings is, is way down in the tech or way further in the line and uh, I want them to know up front that they're going to save. Um, and so it, it evolved a little bit um, to, to using an icon at least and then the, the third is, is where we're at now um, where the savings is emphasized. Um, it's the back to the your degree, no textbooks. And then what is that going to mean to the student? You're going to save up to $2,200 on your entire degree path. Um, and then on the left hand side, we're at the point now that we've been doing this long enough. Uh, we set ourselves a goal of saving students $1 million uh, in a three year period. Uh, we're more than halfway there. Uh, we're definitely going to make that goal. But now that's something that we can also use uh, in print ads is, is some sort of thermometer or odometer image to, to show this accumulating total of savings uh, and we're hoping that that will be very attention grabbing for our uh, potential students. I think that's all my slides. Okay. Yes. Any questions for me? I love what the pop too. <laughs> I may have to try and re-engage on that. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, Mark, for giving us that view of um, what you've done at um, at Pierce College JDLM. Um, and I think it's it's very unique in that you do have a somewhat different student population, but I think the principles. Um, do remain the same. Um, I don't think I saw any other questions specifically in here. So, um, Mark, I think uh, what we'll do is we'll, uh, Mark will still be here, and will and he'll um, be available for questions at the end. Um, and I think we're just going to move on to our next couple of speakers, who are going to share very briefly um, some of the great work they're doing. Um, and next up, I have uh, James Guapa Grossclegg from College of the Canyons. He's the Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources, and Distance Learning there. And um, James at, at, at his college and with uh, his faculty and staff have been working on OER for um, nearly a decade now. 
and uh, they're getting involved in Z degrees. They have been for a couple of years. And um, James, um, please. Yeah, hey, about the work. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, can you go on to the next slide? Thank I you very will. much. Appreciate that. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, boy, saying, saying that we've been working on this for a decade or more, or nearly a decade, makes me feel a lot of pressure. We should probably have accomplished a lot more, but uh, uh, we continue to be inspired by our colleagues in Virginia and Washington. And I want to talk about just three or four points here uh, that, that are going on in California and at College of the Canyons. First of all, in California, we're fortunate that the state legislature and that the, uh, our state system office has uh, really uh, been devoting more attention and more resources to OER. Uh, uh, last year, legislation was passed uh, that will require, beginning in January 2018, will require uh, community colleges and our state universities to uh, identify in their schedules of classes uh, all sections that are using OER. So, so as, as we've seen in, in, in Virginia and Washington, uh, we're really looking forward to that coming into uh, widespread practice here in California. Uh, we have to explain to faculty sometimes that this doesn't mean that you're required to use OER, but rather that you're required to inform your students when you are. So we think that will uh, generate a lot of uh, interest and attention on the part of uh, uh, institutions, uh, enrollment management perspective as well as faculty perspective, and we hope that we will see a lot of uh, uh, student outreach and marketing around that or arising from that. Uh, at College of the Canyons, we've been uh, fortunate to uh, engage our students with multiple channels of communication that range from um, uh, including students in, in, in our team, in our OER team, uh, which has been really a, a real boon to us. It helps us to uh, keep a fresh eye on how to communicate to students. So one of our uh, really bright uh, uh, employees in, in, in our OER team here has uh, authored, authored uh, uh, articles and press releases for, for student publications, and that's been terrific. She's uh, developed uh, banners and images that uh, inform students about free textbooks, and uh, it's really helpful for us, or for me at least, to have uh, the student perspective on things and, and uh, the student eye on how to design the marketing uh, information, uh, as well as um, uh, getting stu the student government involved has been really helpful for us uh, in terms of uh, advocating within the institution. So uh, last year we were uh, very pleased that our student government passed a resolu resolution calling for uh, faculty to consider the use of OER. Uh, it's really a very powerful statement in which they refer to the increasing debt load that they experienced. Uh, the uh, failure of publishers to respond to student needs and their concern about uh, the impact of textbooks on their uh, academic performance. Uh, so that, that resolution has been helpful for us in uh, convincing others in the institution, uh, primarily faculty, to consider OER. We have not done a very good job uh, in leveraging that resolution to uh, encourage students to uh, pay attention to uh, OER sections, but we look forward to, to doing that uh, in a more concentrated way or coordinated way this summer when we will be uh, launching our OER indicator in our class schedule prior to the uh, state requirement in January 2018. Uh, and finally, I, I don't have it written up here, but uh, I, I do want to call attention to uh, the utility of having student data or data about concerns and student performance related to us. It's very helpful for us, I think, to be able to speak to faculty uh, about uh, local student concerns. So we can, you know, we've all seen, all of us here on the call have seen uh, national data about textbook, the cost of textbooks and their impact on student success. But we, we have that similar data from our own students. So we can tell our faculty that our students here uh, the percentage of our students who identify textbook costs as the major, as the number one barrier to their educational goals is 75 percent, and, and so on and so forth. So that's very helpful, I think, uh, to have our own students uh, uh, reflected in the data that we use. And then also, uh, we will uh, be closing that loop or continuing that, that framing uh, 
by uh, gathering data and, and documenting student uh, success and retention rates and, and completion rates uh, through the OER courses so that we'll have, again, the ability to talk about the efficacy of OER at our own institution with our own students. Otherwise, uh, again, congratulations to our, our colleagues uh, in Washington, Washington and uh, Virginia, and thanks for their continued inspiration. That's it. Uh, thank you so much, James, uh, for sharing uh, the work that you're doing there. And um, and um, I'm going to move this on. I think we had a quick question for you in the chat window about um, someone would like to find out if you have any student design publications around OER. And um, I'll let you answer that in the chat window, James. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, and James is. Um, just um, had an OER summit day at his college um, back in late January where he invited um, folks from around the state of California and he had over 140 attendees um, come from different colleges, uh, primarily in Southern California, but I think some Northern California as well. So um, a lot happening in California too. And now um, I'd like to turn this over to Preston Davis, uh, who's the Director of Instruction at the Extended Learning Institute. And of course, um, many of our earlier speakers have referred back to Preston because he's really one of the pioneers um, at NOVA, along with Tidewater, who started doing these OER-based degrees back in 2013. And so they have a lot of data and really a lot of knowledge um, to, and strategies to share with us about um, what works and doesn't work um, at their college. Preston? Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to briefly mention about how we are trying to really increase uh, awareness and about the OER degree programs that we have at NOVA and how we sort of went about um, you know, visioning, uh, creating a degree pathway, starting with our online courses, um, and then really growing that to include courses that are taught uh, hybrid and on campus at all of our six campuses of NOVA. Um, and as we've grown our program and really gotten uh, faculty to embrace this and, and really turn into a more grassroots type faculty led endeavor at this point. Um, trying to keep in mind that, you know, we talk about OER uh, and open pedagogy among faculty and administrators, uh, but students don't really know what those terms mean. Uh, and so we really have to try to keep things simple and let students know that uh, when they see some of these things, the reality is that uh, it will allow them to take a course without having to purchase textbooks. And we know that there are a lot of benefits to sharing and, and, and to uh, open uh, material, but you know, the bottom line for students uh, is that cost-saving mechanism, uh, particularly for community college students, because uh, that does uh, give them the opportunity to have access to the material from day one because they're not having to choose whether or not they can afford to purchase it. And also, um, it really uh, takes stress away from uh, those folks in determining how they're going to allocate their funds. Um, and we've seen in some cases that it allows students to uh, put that money towards uh, taking additional course credits and, and hopefully completing their degrees in, in a more expedited manner. Um, and so we've had some challenges with making it really simple for our students uh, to find information. So first and foremost, we published a list of what those courses were. And we started by putting a note, uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, in our online schedule of classes. So when students would search uh, for courses, we would denote in that course um, and we refer to those courses as digital open uh, because we wanted to make sure that students understood that they were going to be uh, accessing free digital uh, and open content in these course, courses so that there was this expectation of uh, having to access material in a digital format. 
um, but that no textbook purchase was required. And we also made sure that uh, in partnership with our bookstore that they indicated when students were searching for course sections that were uh, OER for our institution that it stated specifically that there was no textbook required for that course so that students didn't have confusion um, if they were having to order textbooks for other courses. Um, and we're finally at the point now where we're able to uh, work on uh, updating our SIS system which will allow students to actually search for courses uh, based on an indicator that uh, specifies that a course is OER or low cost um, uh, materials less than $40, which is, is really uh, inspired by what Maricopa uh, in Arizona has done um, in making sure that they were able to differentiate and promote to students the courses that uh, would allow them to uh, either complete a course without having to purchase textbooks or uh, those that required low-cost materials to be able to complete their courses. So that's sort of where we are at this point. We're always looking for more innovative ways to share this information with students in a way that they will understand what the implications are for, for them and their learning. So thank you. Uh, thank, thanks so much, uh, Preston, for um, sharing so much, that. Uh, Preston, for um, sharing that. That you've been doing. You may need to turn off your. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, your speaker. Um, um, and and I'm, I'm I'm excited to hear that you're going to add search as well to the capability in your um, course registration. And um, we at this point, I think we want to open this up to other folks. And I I might suggest. Uh, looks like we lost Lisa. Lisa um, Young was here earlier. Um, Lisa, I think you've um, had to take off. But Lisa is from Maricopa Community College. And I'm not sure if anyone else here is from Maricopa. But as Preston mentioned, Maricopa has had this for several years in their course registration system, not only um, having the designation, but actually allowing students to search for, um, I think their designation is low cost or, or free textbooks, but it refers to OER or textbooks that are less than $40. And so a really powerful way, a powerful tool to give students uh, to find um, these classes. And let's um, open it up now to others who might have questions or comments. And, um, We have the capability of six simultaneous speakers, so um, you can um, raise your hand and grab the microphone, or you can simply grab the microphone by clicking on the talk button or typing in the chat window for us. While we're waiting for some questions, or um, I wanted to mention that I, I regretfully uh, forgot to mention that Santa Fe College in Florida joined us in January. We actually had we had over eight colleges that joined us in the last two months, and uh, we're just thrilled to have Santa Fe Community College uh, as a member of CCCOER. They joined Broward College in Florida as a member, and also the Florida Virtual Campus is a system-wide member of CCCOER. And I know that uh, Debbie, uh, Debbie Blair is here from Santa Fe College, who is, uh, is their representative, their leader of OER there. And also, um, she's an instructional designer and adjunct faculty there. And um, she is uh, preparing some materials for Open Education Week um, to share some of the early work they're doing. Um, they've been working on OER for a relatively short period of time. Oh, and thank you, Angela. Angela. Uh, in the chat window mentioned that she's from Maricopa and that um, the SIS system there uses the terms low cost or no cost. Um, once again, a reminder that we will have our webinars both on March 28th and March 29th um, about uh, OER adoption. And then on the Wednesday, the 29th, will be OER degrees. We have Lansing Community College, Open Oregon participating with us 
on the 28th, and then we'll have Austin Community College and in in Austin, Texas, and Montgomery Community College in Maryland sharing uh, their OER degree work on the 29th. So we look forward to having you at uh, those sessions. And I um, just wanted to mention that uh, we are maintaining a list of conferences um, related to open education on our website. It, you can go to under Get Involved and look at those conferences. And I want to thank Kiri Dolly, who's a um, one of our um, advisory board uh, VPs, and she helps us coordinate the website, and she's been maintaining those. Um, I think for those of you um, who are in the open education uh, movement here, uh, you may know that Open Ed was just announced. I think it was was it it was late last week that uh, Open Ed will be in October this year in Anaheim, California, um, and. Um, we also have um, we we also have the Year of Open, uh, which um, our parent organization is um, is running this year. It's it's our big anniversary, the 10 year anniversary of the Cape Town Declaration for Open Education, and each month we're taking a different theme at that website around open. Uh, this February was open source. Uh, January was open education. August is going to be community colleges and open education. So stay tuned for that. And it looks like we had another question. Did we have any other questions, Cynthia? Cynthia is helping me to um, to gather questions. Um, one final thing I think is uh, Regina asked earlier about how are you working with bookstores. And so I want to ask any of my speakers here. Uh, would you like to share how you are working with bookstores on providing OER solutions or information around OER to students? Yeah, this is James. I'll be happy to talk about uh, our bookstore. Thank you. Um, uh, so again, James College of the Canyons. Uh, our bookstore is a private third party vendor, Barnes and Noble. They're excellent partners. Uh, we, I think, it, you know, they're excellent partners for many reasons. Uh, uh, beginning with the fact that we have approached them as partners. Uh, they're important to the campus. They're important to the community. Uh, we've approached them and said, we're not trying to put you out of business. We want to find a way to keep you in the game. Uh, it's, it's helpful for all of us if, if, you're, if you're healthy. Um, so the, uh, certainly when we're uh, utilizing OpenStax, that's a, that's a no-brainer. They can, they can order the, the print copies of the OpenStax and students can, and they, and they can retail the OpenStax books there, uh, and that's fine. Uh, in addition, we, when we have uh, faculty using open, book, open textbooks that we have helped them to compile, so uh, putting together multiple different sources to create a, a web version, we work with our repro graphics, in-house repro graphics or print shop to print a text version, uh, maybe free hole punch it, maybe put it in a plastic bag depending on how big it is and, and how, how uh, uh, important it is to have it in a certain order. Uh, and uh, we'll take that over to the bookstore. The bookstore will inventory it, uh, put it on their shelves, mark it up uh, to cover their costs, uh, and then uh, uh, we let students know that Print copies are available in the bookstore for uh, for a cost. That's a way of keeping the bookstore in the game, in our mind. Um, it, it's not the case with all college stores, but many college stores are seeing a shift in their revenue from uh, textbooks uh, to rentals or from textbooks to merchandise. So, uh, finding a way to continue. To encourage student foot traffic to come into this into the store is, is helpful for the store. Um, yeah, so uh, mostly it comes down to uh, I think a spirit of partnership and collaboration. Uh, they're they're very helpful. Thanks so much, James, for sharing that and for that successful relationship with your um, college bookstore. And we always want to emphasize that. Um, to work with your college bookstore and, and try to find solutions. Um, many of them are, have, have tried various programs. OER might be new to them. Some of them started with rentals quite a few years ago. Um, as we're moving to OER, we want to bring them along with us. Would anyone else like to share? Um, Lida, Mark, or Preston? 
This is Preston. No, I, 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 go, go ahead, Preston. Oh, no, no, please go ahead, Lida. Well, I was going to say the, our experience is kind of the same as James's. If they're a third party vendor, you know, they do, the college gets income from the bookstore, it, it, you know, not a lot, but, but some. And so it's important for us to make sure that their employees understand that when there's an OER that's being used and there isn't a print copy available, that they tell the student that as opposed to trying to sell the student a textbook that they might be using in another section of the same course. That's, all, that's only, the only issue we've had. And I one time actually had to walk with a student to the bookstore and say, so I'm the professor and somebody has sold the student this book and this isn't the right book. And was very nice about it and they were very nice back. And you know, I mean, it's just, it was more important at that point for me to help the student get their money back. And the bookstore wants to be student friendly. And so they try to cooperate and help and we all work together on that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lida. Um, Preston? Yes, I was just going to, to say briefly that, um, you know, our bookstore, they are, are very willing to make sure that the course materials that are required or not required for a particular course are, are very clearly stated. Um, so that there is not any confusion among students for courses that uh, require textbook and those that do not. And so we're able to provide that and they keep a list uh, of that as well so we can compare to make sure that uh, we all are kind of understanding uh, what courses at the college are requiring textbooks and which ones are not. Um, and so I think that there's an understanding that uh, the curriculum uh, really is separate from sort of the uh, the facilities and the uh, the revenue portion of bookstore operations um, and kind of understanding that those things are are, are separate uh, I think really helps uh, us to try to focus on ways that we can uh, work together and make sure that our bookstore is able to provide services um, and, and function um, but our students are also able to uh, save money uh, when and where possible. Th thank you, Preston. And um, Quill, Quill was also supporting that um, in the chat window. And Quill, do you want to speak to that or do you want me to summarize your comment? Go ahead and summarize, Ina, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, you're already online. Why don't you go ahead and say what you just repeat what you had in your comment there? I was just making the point that mostly bookstores see themselves, or at least the bookstore people I've worked with, see themselves as a student service more than a profit center. Um, and so they really just want to be able to help students. Uh, so they prefer to have the information, even if it's information that doesn't make them money. I've heard that quite a, quite a bit as well, Quill. So thank you for sharing that. We want to make sure that they have the information so that they can give that to students. Um, we are a few minutes after the hour, so we are going to have to conclude now. But I want to thank um, all of our excellent speakers, Lida, Mark, uh, James, and Preston, and uh, thank all of you who came this morning. Uh, wonderful questions and participation. This. This webinar and all our webinars are archived and um, the slides are shared and they're usually posted within um, 48 hours and so uh, we look forward to seeing you in March, so uh, later in March. Uh, take care everyone and um, have a great afternoon.